Hi, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture, which launches the Term 2 New Models Lecture Series. Um, the series, which began in the autumn of 2020, has invited architects and other interdisciplinary practitioners to discuss how their work can address um, the models around which society is organized. And um, each event proposes a new model to address how we can shift power structures, socioeconomic forces, and structural inequalities present in society today to give us new tools to rethink the world around us. Over the past year and a half, a series of new models have been presented to underline the need to redesign institutions, redress who has access to funding, reverse the lack of representation in public art and architecture, embrace physical and digital spaces of collective care and mutuality, find new forms of user-led design, community-led practice, as well as discussing new ways to excavate the past in order to deal with conflict in our present, and also address the interconnected and intersectional crises threatening the future of our planet with more to come in the term ahead. And there's probably lots of people who've given these lectures on the call tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Manish Burgis. I'm the head of the AS Public Program, and I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, who through her practice that spans architecture, education, planning, activism, advocacy, and so much more, has sought to create networks and support systems for those dealing with intersectional issues of race and gender, while also transforming our built environment through combinations of teaching and practice. Neba Sere is an architect and lecturer at The Bartlett. She's a co-director of Black Females in Architecture, which she founded together with Selassie Setufe, Akua Danso, and Alicia Morenike Fisher after a series of chance encounters from 2017 onwards and their shared experience of negotiating a white male dominated profession. Neba has led on design and construction projects with young people at Build Up Foundation and was formerly one of six young trustees of the Architectural Foundation. Her interest lies in understanding the process of decolonizing the architecture profession and thus the built environment, specifically looking at how citizen-led initiatives can have a long-term impact on the spaces we inhabit and involving young communities in the regeneration process of their city through advocacy and outreach. Tonight, she'll present a new model for race and gender equity, discussing how Black Females in Architecture, or BFA, emerged organically from conversations and experiences and has grown into the membership and advocacy organization that we know today. As it continues to evolve, new questions have arisen that Neba will discuss in the context of both her own career, as well as BFA's quest to hold the built environment and its related industries to account in order to create a more equitable society. Before I hand over to Neba, a few notes on the format. Um, she'll give her lecture and following that, I'll ask a few initial questions before opening it up to the audience for a wider discussion. So um, feel free to post your questions in the chat at any point, and I can either ask it on your behalf or if you'd like to ask it, just use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen on Zoom and I can unmute you to ask it yourself. And um, if you feel comfortable to do so, especially when the lecture is over and we're having the conversation, please um, turn your camera on so we can all at least feel like we're in the same space, despite the series still being held online. So um, I'm really delighted to have Neva joining us tonight um, for this talk and to launch this series in term two. And it's such an important topic and conversation for us to have here at the AA. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about her inspiring career and ideas for change. So please join me in welcoming her to the AA. Thank you so much, Mani J. Um, hello, everyone. It's really nice to be here. It's nice uh, for you all to have me. Um, and thanks for the lovely intro as well. Um, so yeah, um, as Mani J said, these are the current roles that I have. Um, I think to begin, I'd like to give you an overview of um, the journey that I personally took um, in the industry. Um, and I'd say it's been very diverse, non-traditional, and uh, not necessarily the journey that was recommended or um, suggested when I was in education. Um, I think when I was an architecture student, I had the impression that there was just one possible way to practice, uh, and that's as a qualified architect. Um, but over the past few years, I've realized that it's much more exciting than that, luckily, <laughs> and that we all should talk more about what's possible with an architectural skill set, especially for, I would say, the students in the room. So yeah, I picked out a few things that I'm currently doing, have done in the past, and a few projects I thought would be interesting for you. And then I'll go into BFA's journey and then we can open up to some questions. Um, so currently at um, UCL The Bartlett, I co-lead um, UG10, Poly Rhythms, um, the undergrad unit with my colleague Pedro Gill. Um, our aim for this unit is to um, center the Latin American architecture discourse. Um, interestingly, it's the first time that has happened at the Bartlett. 
Um, so we look at looking at historical um, and contemporary north-south paradigms, um, and we choose a country every year to investigate. This year we're looking at Haiti, um, which isn't often thought about as a Latin American country, as it's in the Caribbean as well. Um, and we thought after 2020, that was a very good way uh, to get into topics such as um, the erasure of blackness uh, in culture, also in contemporary Latin American culture. Um, so with our students, we want to celebrate Haiti, um, blackness and Afro-Latin American life and through the lens of design projects. So our students have started on that journey. Some really interesting projects are emerging. Uh, and yeah, keep, keep your eyes peeled for what they're coming up with. And it's definitely a self-led journey. So we don't necessarily tell students what to investigate. They find their own way to connect with, with Haiti, which is always very exciting. Um, so going back to my earlier days after um, in practice, I um, graduated from Central St. Martins after um, moving to the UK from Germany. I had a fairly technical undergrad um, at the RWTH Aachen, uh, then came to, I would say, the most activist <laughs> school <laughs> for architecture in the country. Um, and yeah, it was a, was a great experience. Um, I joined the Architecture Foundation's first cohort of the young trustees um, after graduating, um, as the AF felt that emerging voices were needed to have some impact on their program and activities. Alongside Benny Allen, I uh, co-led and ran the part four event series, which was um, aimed at in young practices and emerging practices to pitch questions to an experienced panel of practitioners. Um, and that direct contact with very, fairly practical uh, questions was um, extremely useful, not just for myself at the time, but for many emerging practices. Um, as Manny J mentioned, I was uh, part of Build Up Foundation. That was my first professional role <laughs> after part two um, as a um, youth construction lead. Um, build Up empower young people to shape the places they live and make decision-making in London's built environment, um, which is representative of, of obviously the um, culturally diverse community. Um, I managed one of the biggest uh, build-ups uh, public space projects um, in uh, Northeast London, uh, The Shade, which uh, was constructing a new community and public space uh, in the center of a housing estate with the local young people. This was part of the London Borough of Waltham Forest Making Places Initiative. Um, throughout the years, I've practiced architecture in a variety of ways, I'd say. Um, I had a part one experience at Studio Weave, a part two experience at um, Pennion Passade, um, also some self-directed projects with Wu Architecture, and most recently been a senior project officer at the GLA, where I managed the delivery of innovative projects that promote urban regeneration and economic growth in collaboration with London Boroughs and other partners. Um, one project example from the, my time at the GLA is um, Kingsley Hall, Community Centre and Church Hall. This is a transformational project um, of a very long-standing uh, community centre in the Back and Tree Estate in Dagenham Barking. Um, Kingsley Hall was preparing for its sanitary and it secured one and a half million from the Mayor's Good Gold Fund uh, to support the refurbishment and extend, extension of their community campus. This was to meet their ambition to provide additional economic impacts through uh, the incubation and support of local social enterprises uh, that operate out of the center. So the center is supporting um, a wide array of uh, local initiatives um, has been doing for years, especially through the pandemic. Um, another thing that was interesting is that the project was delivered through an innovative cross-laminated timber construction method um, developed by engineers to be structural, decorative, and um, the final finish of the surfaces. So this is making the point that community spaces can be leaders in innovative design and construction. Um, and for those of you who like a nice Instagram account, <laughs> do follow them. They post everything about the build, the current build, um, in, in a really fun way. So I do have a look. Um, they should be finishing construction uh, this year. So again, you can have a Keep an eye out for that. Um, final practice example for now is um, Decosm. Um, before I get into BFA's journey, 
Uh, DECOSM stands for Decolonized City Making, um, which was set up in early 2020 alongside Umi Baden Powell. Um, we aim to respond to the widespread concerns around social, environmental, and spatial inequalities in a built environment. Um, so it's a research uh, and think tank collective. Um, after hosting a very successful event with the Architecture Foundation in early 2020 around decolonizing architecture and the profession, we continue to do collaborative projects. Um, one example is deconstructing colonialism, uh, which was part of the installation How We Live Now, reimagining spaces with Matrix Feminist Design Cooperative. Um, this was shown at the Barbican um, and at the end, towards the end of last year. Um, I hope you were able to see it, <laughs> or some of you in the room were able to see it. Uh, the installation explored how, um, who our buildings are uh, made for um, and um, the shared spaces around them and how do they affect us. Um, and we developed an activity around deconstructing colonialism, which was included in the alternative exhibition catalog, Revealing Objects by Edit Collective. Um, deconstructing colonialism is an invitation to a personal journey to unpack the process of colonization, um, to then help to create our own interpretation of what colonialism is and how it may have an implication on our own life and provoke some ideas on how to challenge it. Um, so one of the activities was around my own colonial journey, so mapping some family histories and, um, you know, deconstructing what colonialism might have meant in your own family life. I'm always very keen on personal experiences and in, interconnected with the professional, because I think that allows us to build empathy for, for everyone. Um, okay, so uh, on to the BFA um, journey. Um, and our quest to hold the built environment to account to improve race and uh, gender equity. So when you type in architect in Google, uh, what do you think comes up? <laughs> I'll let you guess, or you can do it. Um, so yeah, architecture is for everyone, uh, used by everyone. But um, we, but we see that one demographic is seemingly leading um, the conversation around built environment um, decision making. Um, and designing of spaces. Um, so where are all the black women in architecture is what we are asking. The BFA is a community and network um, supporting more than 400 members globally, um, members of black and black mixed heritage and architecture design and construction. And we advocate for race and gender equity in our profession. We want to see our members be represented visible and leading the way in shaping the future of our cities. At present, the UK's architecture profession is 83% white and 78% male dominated. <clears throat> Black women form less than 1% of the architecture profession. In urban cities such as London has 45% Black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, demographic. Our cities aren't being built and designed by the people that work and live in them. The BFA is led by Queer Danso, um, Selassie so Setsu and myself. Um, as black women, we are challenging continuously the notions of what a traditional architect or built environment professional is. Through our very existence in the industry and our work, we keep pushing the boundaries. So Queer is an architect at heart, specializing in medium-sized residential and commercial projects. Delassi is a senior architect and program manager at Be First, embarking in Dagenham. And we're extremely proud to say that Selassie was recently awarded an MBE for her uh, services to diversity in architecture. So, so clap. <laughs> Hopefully everyone claps with me. <laughs> yeah, we super chuffed. Um, so back in 2018, we met at an event and we were surprised to see each other after being uh, used to seeing only black um only black and female being the only black and female person in the room so that was at an architecture industry event eventually we invited other black women um to join a whatsapp group that we had set up to stay in touch and um soon we realized we weren't the only ones in the field at all <laughs> so we had a wrong impression so until bfa was established we've all had the common feeling of being unseen and unsupported at university or in our workspaces. Some of the com common barriers that emerged during engagements with each other uh, were a lack of role models in academia, 
and managerial positions and practice. Um, limited work experience or access to work experience, um, unconscious bias at university or when applying for jobs, um, financial constraints and a very long route to qualification. So that is where the drop off happens. Many women start in architecture, but they don't stay in. It's the same for black women or even more. Um, a lack of mentorship and support, um, the common feeling that you are alone and singular in your experience, as well as the Western and male dominated um, references at educational level. These are just a few, there are many more. <laughs> um, so BFA provides a community for black women to share, learn and um, from, they, from their shared experiences and develop new skills. Um, we are a network of positive role models um, who inspire and uplift each other. To support our membership, we organize a variety of events and activities. Um, and I thought I'd talk you through some of the things we've done in the past few years um, to give you an idea. Um, these often happen in partnership with other organizations or institutions. So we have um, shared lots of content um, placement and project opportunities with our BFA network. Last year, for example, we shared 150. And some of these jobs obviously got to our BFA members and they started new roles, which is always a great thing. Um, we've launched our uh, pilot job and projects ad service. So if you have a job um, that you wanna share with our network, you can do that through us as well as a project as we have many freelancers or architects who want to work on things like extensions or things, personal private projects. Um, so Aretha, for example, joined BuildUp last year for a placement in the summer. Um, she is an engineer student um, and she got to actually build and construct a roof with your young community um, and uh, for a youth space. And uh, she, she really enjoyed that experience because hands-on experience is very hard to get these days. Um, we've enabled about 50 paid speaking opportunities for BFA members um, at public um, environment events through our BFA Advocates Program. So we have a series of um, our members that we like to promote um, for events such as this one, uh, for them to uh, represent BFA, because we have lots of incredible members doing really interesting things. And we want to make sure they're all seen and visible and highlighted. So for example, um, Aaliyah joined a panel about women in architecture and construction to talk about her experiences in education. That was a, in collaboration with Dizine. Um, we hosted a series of um, public and also exclusive member events, for example, book clubs. Um, this one was uh, as well as guys and partners. Uh, we had a CV and skills workshop and one-to-one -one mentoring with the RIBA, um, a recycled plastics and making workshop at the Design Museum. And then we hosted um, this BFA member only event, Living Room Sessions, which uh, was really integral for us to sit down with each other and think about some of the shared experiences that we've had through um, exploring a specific topic. This is where most of the tough things are put on the table and we are able to understand actual issues that are in our industry. So through these personal experiences, we are able to um, understand the change that we need to be enacting. Um, in the past two years, we have also hosted more digital events, such as our Instagram live series, Dance Dialogues, hosted by artist choreographer Dr. Adeshola Akinleye, who was in conversation with some of our BFA members about their own practices and how they may connect to, um, to her practice of movement and stillness and being a Black woman in space as a dancer. Really interesting. They're still on, um, on our Instagram channel if you want to check them out. Um, we also were able to have a first in real life event after two years um, towards the end of last year, which was really good. A collaboration with MFest, um, Muslim Fest, um, curated by um, a host of really wonderful BFA members. The event was titled Houses of Wisdom um, and was exploring traditions of knowledge in Muslim and vernacular architecture across Sub-Saharan Africa. Again, there's a summary of this event, an audiovisual collage on our website, so to have a look. Um, we also have some example of our BFA members' press coverage. Um, so Neola was interviewed by Design Milk about her personal um, architecture journey and also the things that she wants to do in the future. We always love to see our members be represented in, in situations like this, or um, Toby writing uh, for the AJ, why I need to see more black faces in architecture. 
um, most uh, more recently, Nana was um, joined um, Patrick Massey um, on a piece for for the AJ as well, uh, which was reimagining um, <laughs> conversations between architects and um, celebrities. This one was between Joseph and Baker and Adolf Lowe's. <laughs> it's quite a funny short one to, to read it. Um, and finally, some of BFA uh, member projects, because this is where we think we have a good and real life impact um, in the built environment. Um, the Bricks and Dominus Club has um, a stellar three BFA member strong team, um, Tara Bolade, Stephanie Edwards and Charlene Campbell, as well as a whole host of um, other in in incredible collaborators. So this is an ongoing project um, that we'll share more about when, when it's continuing. Um, Shay uh, did a plastic pavilion at the Brainchild Festival a few years ago. Maybe you've seen this one. Um, and then this year, um, Shay collaborated with more BFA members and, and other, other um, um, community members um, on a uh, mirrored structure for the Brainchild Festival. So we love to see these collaborations happen and led by BFA members. Um, so we truly believe that tackling diversity, the diversity crisis in architecture will enable us to create a better built environment for and better lived experiences for everyone. <clears throat> That's why we're doing this world work. That's why we want to see our BFA members um, um, making decisions ultimately and supported to do so. Um, to support our work, you can uh, donate to us. We are operating on a voluntary basis. Um, so all of us have day jobs. <laughs> um, obviously, we love this work. But uh, yeah, this, this, this can only happen by uh, really um, helpful uh, people in the world helping us with things like this. And obviously, we remuneration for our activities as well. So I think um, I'm really keen to have a conversation with you all uh, to discuss how we can actually make the change that we know we need. Um, and I thought I'd just give you a few pointers, <laughs> very basic things, but I, I thought I'd say it anyway. Practical notes um, on things to do or not to do, depending on how you look at it. Um, and we can discuss it more in the Q&A. So I think hire black women and black women-led organizations, um, support black women, listen to black women, black, they pay black women, diversify and decolonize the curriculum and become and maintain to be an ally. So, yeah, thank you. Um, just some social media handles in case you wanted to get in touch or if there are some BFA members in the room or potential ones, you can always become a member, we'd love to have you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. And like so much content in like we've delivered in a short time. It's like really incredible to see all the many things you've done and then really how um, BFA has grown so much in a short span of time and, and achieved so much through like a whole host of different platforms and events and initiatives. Um, there's like such a huge audience gathered here. So I feel like there's going to be lots of great questions. Um, right. And uh, but in the, uh, maybe just to kick things off. Um, I was just, I guess I was just really interested in, um, I think the name Black Females in Architecture is really great because it, it's really accessible. Everyone understands what it is. But when we were chatting about the lecture before, uh, in preparation for tonight, um, we were talking about like, you know, how do you define the, each of those words? It seems obvious in the first instance, but like, obviously these conversations are, are changing on, on a daily basis. And I was just curious as to, kind of how you as a group uh, are, are kind of evolving and thinking about what each of those three words mean? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think there's always a moment every few months where we question ourselves whether the name is appropriate. <laughs> um, I think there's several things. Um, obviously, as you said, it's very easy to understand and it, it, it's almost like a call to action in, in, the, in the time that we're in. Um, but at the same time, we also want to be critical and not necessarily exclusive uh, to people. So, you know, um, Black and Black mixed heritage women, um, it's, it's a broad range. Um, it's not one monogamous group. And I think sometimes when people work with us or, or, or you know, collaborate with us, they think all our experiences are the same. And that is so far away, the intersectional issues that, you know, you can have. Um, and even the word women, you know, it's, 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 it's also exclusive in this time, or females, actually. 
Um, so yeah, we we need to be aware of the intersectional issues of um, all the isms. <laughs> it's not just just racism and um, you know sexism, but also um, you know uh, thinking about neurodiverse communities of age, um, you know, of um, all the intersectional issues that can be at play, and uh, we want to be inclusive to that. Um, and also we want people to be aware that um, we aren't one voice, but we are many voices, and that means very different experiences. Definitely, I think that's so important. I think, um, yeah, like I've, I, I've been thinking about this a lot as well, and I think there's so much that's been written about even the, the use of the word um, or the acronym BAME, to unify like every single like person of color as though they have like the same singular experience. Um, and uh, I, I just think it's really fascinating as well, like um, what you were saying about like some of the spaces where these things have taken place as well, um, whether, you know, I, I loved the, I guess, living room sessions, or um, I, I also love the fact of like the dance dialogues. And I think like experimenting with formats is a great way to get people involved and um, to make the work that you're doing really visible. Um, I just wanted to like remind people that if um, you feel comfortable to do so, it'd be great to turn your camera on. Um, if, uh, it'd be really nice if we could see some of you. So it's just not the two of us. Shumi, I saw you briefly, so maybe you can come back. But <laughs> I'll just pick on you. But, um, anyone else, please um, join us. Nice to see some faces. Hello. Some <laughs> faces as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Um, Hi. So, yeah, I mean, I can already see some questions starting to appear in the chat. So, but maybe just to ask, like, how you um, maybe decide what formats to use and like where these things should take place, and also like maybe the how over the last, um, I guess, over the last two years, like how have you found ways to still connect your network and and invite new members to participate despite everything being online? I mean, I saw that the dance dialogues are on Instagram and things like that, but yeah. it'd be great to hear more about that. Yeah. Um... I think the we've noticed that being um, able to meet in person has obviously it's a really good really good opportunities. Especially the living room sessions were very small sessions where it almost feels like therapy. <laughs> you know, you feel like you're in a therapy room talking to each other, and that's so effective to get to the nuts and um, you know and bolts of some issues. At the same time, that's not possible. Because we, for everyone, because we are a digital platform and we have members all over the world. We have members in the USA and African countries and um, all over Europe. So for us to be able to reach those members, we also do um, similar sessions. At, we've trialed them digitally in the early pandemic days. Um, and that also has worked very well. But I think the next stage of that will be BFA members being able to meet each other in the places that they are and things happening beyond us. And I think this is really our hope for the future that, you know, we we are initiators, but actually we want our BFA members to find each other and to learn from each other, collaborate. That can be through projects, but it can also just be over a cup of tea <laughs> or something else, because um, that, that's uh, normally very beautiful moments. And we started operating on WhatsApp. We maximize it. <laughs> we couldn't be on there anymore. So we moved to Slack, which is a little bit less intuitive. But at the same time, we are able to um, have quite directed conversation about things like opportunities or areas of the world that you are in. And sometimes these connections that I'm talking about are happening on there. And I think those are my favorite moments when people find each other or find find similar interests. And in terms of the formats that you mentioned, um, we are really keen again for our BFA members to make decisions. So usually, you know, with the dance dialogues, it was um, Dr. Adeshola um, um, writing a book about uh, with the same title, and uh, us discussing how we can talk about it. And you know, that was something that was um, curated by her. So we're really keen for BFA members to bring these formats to the table, and we'll support them as best as we can to make these things happen. So really, that's 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 I, our, our model. Amazing. Um, I think it's just incredible, like how much like stuff you've created and like how many initiatives and people you've brought together. And just as a shout out to this audience, I think this is the most cameras I've ever had on in like two years of being on Zoom. So hey. thank you so much. This is like the most incredible, amazing group of faces to get to see online. And hopefully we can all come together in some space before long. But um, just wanted to check as well if anyone has any questions to post into the chat or please like, um, raise your hand and ask them because um, I would 
yeah, it's not just meant to be me and never talking. It's supposed to be all of you as well. Um, I think I, actually Cass posted something in the chat. Um, so the question is, uh, so interesting how you mentioned that you didn't follow the typical architectural path, which was the same um, for them. And so the question is, is the typical architectural path not fit for purpose for the BAME demographic? Which is a great question, because I think, never you and I talked about that when we were having our pre-chat as well, about how... I constantly find that um, women of color take alternative routes through practice or they try and do multiple things as a way of trying to change um, I, the, I guess, the situation they find themselves in or make the profession better for them to exist within and everyone who comes before and after them. But it'd be great to hear you reflect on that. Yeah. Um, I think there's two two ways um, to look at this. Firstly, um, I would say the mainstream traditional architecture discourse uh, was never as interesting to me, and that may be offensive to some people. <laughs> but when I was going through, you know, architecture school, especially the very technical first few years, um, I graduated and thought, but what am I doing this for? Um, you know, what's the purpose? <laughs> I need a bigger purpose to work towards. Um, and to me, that was societal change and, um, you know, social justice. I think this purpose can be different for different people. That's just what I needed. So, you know, I, I, I changed my route a little bit. And as much as I love making things, don't get me wrong, as much as I love drawings and details and all of that, it's a part of it, but I needed that, you know, bigger purpose um, to fit in. Um, so that's one. I think that's missing. And, and the other thing is, the reason why that was missing for me personally is because of my cultural background and heritage and, um, in Germany, I was the only black girl in school out of a thousand people, for example. Um, so, you know, some of the topics and, um, you know, people that were brought for lectures, as basic as that might sound, all of these things were necessarily in, in, in line with my interest. At the time, I didn't really understand that. I just thought architecture isn't for me. So it's a feeling of being excluded because the topics that are discussed aren't necessarily in line with you. And it doesn't always need to be cultural or identity or world architecture, but it's something to do with um, how, how do you fit in? And I think addressing that through the curriculum is extremely important. I'm not saying throw the canon away, <laughs> you know, um, you know, we can listen to Le Corbusier and everyone else, but at the same time, we need to be very conscious that women are, aren't represented the same way, um, especially uh, black women or you know, people of color. And they are out there, that's the thing. It's just a lot more work to actually go and find them or um, make the effort to just change. And usually I'd say students are a great resource to get to have help with that change. <laughs> they have a lot of knowledge and they are already on the train of the change. So if it's difficult for some uh, people in education, I think, speak to your students because they know where, what direction to go. Um, that's the first part. And the second part is there's something around practicality. So again, from personal experience, I didn't have the money to, to buy fancy materials or print my um, A A1 drawings and really fancy paper. So ultimately, I just didn't look as good as my other people, you know, and that's that's just very basic. But the financial commitment to studying architecture is a lot. And then once you're through it, you realize you don't gain much. If, and, and it's not just it's not just about being a rich person. It's being a person to, that is able to live in London or comparing yourself to your peers or people that you went to primary school with and realizing that you're miles away um, in the financial <laughs> um, you know, agenda. So personally, I realized that as much as I enjoyed architecture practice, it wasn't necessarily feasible for me to work that way. And I needed to look at <clears throat> a different way of practicing. Um, on a practical note, out of interest as well. Um, and I think the other point is, again, this, not, this feeling of not necessarily being welcome or part of the room, it's, it's continued in architecture profession, no practice. Um, so this feeling of not necessarily being able to see yourself um, as an associate director, because there are no women directors, although there are women working next to you as assistants, you know, so it's again, this feeling of I can't make it here. So where can I? And actually, at the end, for me, it was, well, I have to carve my own route. I'm happy with that route. Um, it's just obviously more 
intensive because you have to think about what is that route, carve out new ways. And I wouldn't change a thing. I think I'm really happy with all the things I've done and the different places I've been. Um, but I think not, it's not not everyone is making this alternative practice route by choice, but because they can't actually progress in the places and the more traditional places that they are in. Um, I uh, I'm being distracted by messages that Shumi is sending me in the chat, but um, about our youngest audience member. <laughs> um, you've got. People of all ages tuning in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess um, George has a question which is really interesting. But um, lots of people are feeling shy and are just posting questions in the chat. So I'm just the spokesperson for all these questions. But um, uh, they've asked, "Thanks for your presentation, neighbor. Really insightful in how your professional experience is so diverse, with the increase of awareness regarding inclusion in architecture and the built environment." Do you find that the goals like financial and personal life goals contribute to the drop off of marginalized demographics as you progress in the field? For example, those who are first generation that have grown up in lower income areas, it is likely they would um, like to better their life through financial means. As a lot of us know, architecture does not break the bank. So a lot of people are encouraged to do it for the love. Do you find things like this need to change first to be more inviting to different demographics? Yeah, <laughs> I, I I mean, I think I answered that a little bit. Um, I, th I think it needs to be about the career routes that you can have and being a bit more transparent about what you're going to get as a part one assistant, you know, in, in university or that is not necessarily talked about, the practicality of practicing. Even when you do your part three, uh, it's, it's very rarely discussed, I think. So uh, this being bit more practical with with students or um you know if, if you have that position to understand what are the things that you can do and what is the money that you will get um and it's it's, it's fine if you know you won't make much as an architectural assistant but what are the other things that you can do with your skill set that will have the same impact and maybe that is working in a local authority you know uh, in a regeneration team um, working for a developer or, um, yeah, so many things that you can do, uh, become, uh, work with, with um, contractors. I mean, it's, it's endless, but I think our, our industry is very insular in a way that, um, we go through it. It's not connected to the property market. It's not connected to the development market. And that, that is a problem. And I think that that's where we are missing out as a, as, as a group of people. And I'm also, I have a problem with the wording drop off or failure you know when you when you not when you work for a developer people are like oh my god they went to the bad side or whatever but it's no they're making a decision based on what they need um and you know they bring that skill set to that and i think we just need to be a bit more um yeah collaborative <laughs> in our mindset about that and work with artists i mean it's, it's endless opportunities and i'm sure some of you in the room are doing some really incredible things maybe it's just not themed architecture in the more uh, mainstream context, which is a shame. I think that's so true. And I think there's so many paths through architecture and maybe the professional bodies and and maybe the way it's being taught in some places is, is narrowing that definition rather than expanding it. And which doesn't allow for all these like multiple forms of practice to coexist and be pursued. Um, Lorna, I can see your hand is raised. So I'm just going to um, ask you to unmute. Hi, yeah, I was typing the question and I was thinking I'm going to be bold and I'm just going to ask the question when you... <laughs> just, just what we wanted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much for sharing your rich experience. And <clears throat> you mentioned about, um, I suppose, designing buildings that are fit for people that look like you and I, people that look like the audience. 45%, um, uh, I think in one of your slides, actually there was another percentage, I think you said 85%, or actually maybe it was higher, uh, of people who design um, the cities we live in, the places we live in uh, are white males, and I think 1% or something is women. Uh, I'm not involved in um, your, um, I'm not an architect or anything, but um, I'm just wondering, is there, which building, that currently exists either in London or wherever you're based or in Germany, um, would you like to, a building that's in the public realm, obviously, that you would like to redesign so that it reflects 
how it should have been built in the first place. So it reflects um, a, a diverse community. Wow, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, I think I need to sit with that. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is um, housing um, and social housing because of the recent Grenfell fire, I think, and that tragedy. Um, I think we are, the, the least privileged people in this world are getting the least attention from this industry. Um, so I think that's just something that popped into my mind immediately, um, that we are, as an industry, catering to, have been catering to the people who can pay, and um, you know the people who can't aren't necessarily top of the agenda. Not for everyone. I'm talking um, just mainstream wise, and the kinds of projects that you, the usual architecture practice does is private projects, um, and that's a market that they can access, which is a whole different issue. But <laughs> about public projects, access to public projects. Um, but I think yeah, this is where our attention is needed the most, and. Um, we did a survey with BFA members about what kind of projects they wanted to do. Um, and I think 70% of them were talking about social housing, you know, which is interesting that, but they won't necessarily get experience in that. Um, they want to get access to practices who do that and not many practices do that. So I think the drivers there from people um, is more about, um, you know, how to, how to be able to make those decisions. And maybe it's working within a local authority at policy level that will have the biggest impact rather than designing um, designing the layouts <laughs> for the units. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much for coming. I think um, I love seeing um, a cross collaboration and um, the fact that you are not in this profession is, is great. <laughs> um, Cass, you have your hand raised. Yeah, am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. I always get tripped by that. So <laughs> I haven't. Um, I just want to tap on what you just um, ended with, neighbour, if I pronounced that correctly. Um, I'm an architect, you know, I, I studied, I trained and come, obviously, I'm a black female, if you couldn't tell. Um, but <laughs> coming from my background in training, um, I now work in social housing with housing associations, primarily because of an ethical issue and because I wanted to use my skills to assist people like me and from a background like me. And, and that's what kind of drove me down that path. So when we're speaking about how um, BAME demographic can connect and actually have a presence in architecture, I think it's really important to engage on why you're doing it and what history you come from that makes it worth the while of what you want to do regardless of price price tag or paycheck because at the end of the day with any field you dedicate what 40 hours a week so you really need to know in yourself why are you doing what you're doing and who is it that you want to help and the question I would kind of put to you or to, to everyone on this call is have you actually sat back and asked yourself that question because as I alluded to in my earlier question which um, was put in the chat, you kind of have to know why you're doing these things or question at least if the initial path is fit for purpose for you. So I don't know if that was a question in there, but I just thought I'll, I'll throw that out to the room and get people questioning that. First of all, well, very amazing about the job that you currently do. And I think that's a nice answer to what uh, Lona was asking actually. So that's really great. Um, and I agree. I think the self-directed thought process of why am I doing this is very important. But I think sometimes the way that architecture is thought, that self-directedness is not fostered enough, right? <laughs> so you're always like catching up with delivering the project or the brief, and then you don't think about that until you graduate. So I think if there's any students in the room, asking yourself this question is really integral. I think I started doing that every time I graduated or so every time I was in a job and I was unfulfilled, <laughs> uh, you know, asking, am I doing what I really want to be doing? And not everyone needs to be, you know, uh, bursting out of happiness for the job that they do, but at least a level of contentness is, I think, very important to do your job authentically. 
I think that's a really nice segue into our next question from Joanna in the chat, um, which asks how you got into teaching at university level, um, which has been one of their goals too. And there definitely needs to be more representation in tutors and leadership and architecture at university level, something that's uncontested for sure. Um, and so I think that's really interesting in terms of, I guess also um, maybe to tack on to that, I, you've done so many interesting things in your career and whether you always knew you wanted to do that or whether that how that's developed, I guess, organically over time. Sure. Um, so I think I always liked working with young people because I feel like, um, just feel like the next generation is so far ahead in their minds with where things need to be further than us. Um, it's an incredible potential, uh, incredible knowledge. So when, I, when you say teaching, yes, it's teaching, but I see it more as knowledge sharing because I'm learning as much as hopefully they are. Um, so it's an exchange, you know, it's not me standing up on a podium and lecturing, <laughs> I like to say, although that's the, that's not the kind of teaching I, I'm into. Um, so I think initially working with BuildUp, I realized that I, I could share my skills, um, design skills and construction skills with young people um, through the organization. And that was, that was really incredible because um, you know, some of them had never thought about um, what they could do professionally with, with this kind of skill set. So some of them have gone on to study architecture or engineering or um, work 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 um, with contractors. So I think that's, that's really interesting, just broadening their, their horizons in that sense. And I re always love doing that. Um, secondly, I um, the, the kind of research I was doing into decolonizing the profession, diversifying the profession, um, led me to be, be, get in, in touch with some organizations and institutions, educational ones, um, who realized that they weren't doing this kind of work necessarily, or they wanted to expand the curriculum to do that. So I think having a research um, interest that is different or adding to existing curricula is really interesting. And I think in terms of the decolonized agenda, interest or not just the colonized agenda, also feminist agendas, a lot of student organizations are doing this work already, um, which is really interesting. So I think sometimes, um, yeah, that looking at existing movements within, within the university and what students are doing and talking with to each other is integral for what needs to go into the curriculum. So I think, yeah, it's a combined um, element of wanting to work with the next generation of practitioners, um, learning from them as well as um, want, wanting to share my my research um, interests. Yeah, I mean, just to return to, I guess, um, some of those statistics that you mentioned earlier, but also, I guess, when Lorna was talking about the demographics of like, and what you said about the people who design our built environment aren't, isn't reflective of like, you know, who actually lives and uses it. Um, I think from the very first lecture in this series, which was about um, who has access to funding, um, it was really looking at like how a lot of people, um, I guess, can put their head on the pillow at night and sleep because there's not a lot of data being collected. And so much of the issues around equity or the lack of equity um, begin with like incomplete data. And I think, you know, there's now beginning to be data that's collected about race and there's some data that's collected also, also about gender. But I mean, I thought it was really interesting, the data that you had about like uh, specifically intersectional data and, and, you know, black women. And I think it's that's like the, maybe the root of the problem. Like, how can we even begin to address the problem when we don't even know how many people this is affecting? And I was just wondering, like, um, how data is an obstacle that needs to be overcome and like what are the strategies that that bfa and that you or you personally have found to to get around that or to collect that and to use the network to kind of bring about that kind of change that's a very good question i think um initially when we set up we had a chat with the arba um and our, our arba and um, arb about some of their statistics and numbers um the arb told us that they haven't been collecting um, this kind of data for a long time. They have a register of architects and they differentiate by, by um, gender, but the kind of um, ethnicity is, is a fairly new thing. So finding out, for example, we wanted to find out who was the black female architect, the first one who registered in the UK. Um, 
So that would that was a very difficult question. Um, so I think this is something that is still ongoing, and we would be really keen to find out. But I think institutions aren't necessarily the root, although I know they're keen to do these things. But it takes a very long time, and it's normal that you know this is their system. Um, I think campaigning and um, knowledge from people, word of mouth, um, asking your aunties and your grandmas probably will tell us more <laughs> uh, than, than uh, collecting the data. Uh, and I think that's definitely a project that we can look to in the future because that'd be really interesting. And um, that's happening in the US already. They're counting all the black women who are um, becoming architects. I think they are on 444. I don't think they have everyone at all, um, but it's just making a point about, okay, one more, one more and celebrating that at, at every point. Um, I think that's really beautiful. And it's a campaign that uh, would be really interesting to do. I think institutions are realizing that these numbers are important, but for them to actually put these mechanisms in place will take a very long time. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I, I just, I think your point about like not waiting for institutions is a really interesting one, especially like how networks of support and and that like like BFA that you've created can do so much more, so much more quickly than if waiting around for an institution to act. And actually it's a kind of interesting moment because I feel like a lot of these organizations that are, are just kind of setting up on their own, um, institutions are now very keen to work with them. Um, and I guess that's also a question of like how you decide who to collaborate with and like where, like how to make those kinds of decisions um, as you continue to grow and evolve as a, as a membership organization and with all the work that you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's also, um, I think we've learned a lot <laughs> over the past few years about how we want to work and it took us a, 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 time, a long time to get there in a way. Um, People aren't often coming to um, the conversation with us about what can we do for you, but it's more the other way around. And I think we needed to learn to say, okay, this is not very supportive of for our membership, or if, if we do this, it won't bring any one of us further. And just learning to say no has been a very long journey. I still struggle with that in my personal life, but as for an organization like BFA, that, that was very important. And we are now able to say, no, we won't do that because you know, it's not remunerated or we won't do that because it feels exploitative or are you paying that person for doing that? Or if, we, if you employ a BFA member, will she be the only black person in your office out of 100 people? It's just asking those questions and making whoever we speak to realize that these are very basic questions they could have asked themselves that didn't really need us to do. Um, and for us, that's work, right? That's that's work responding to people like that, or or you know, but getting into a collaboration, understanding if this is actually fitting in with our purpose. Um, I think we are still on the journey. We haven't necessarily figured it out, and that's why the things that we do um, um, are very diverse, and we are keen to test different formats. Um, but we just want to make sure that we keep BFA members at the center of uh, of it. It's terrific. Um, I've got two hands raised, so I guess Lorna, you're first. I'm gonna to come to you first and then to Cass. Funny you, thank you. You um, touched on something, I was gonna type it into the chat, but you touched on something and you alluded to it earlier. What is it that allies can do for BFA? Mm. Um, I think what that would have said before um, about Am I asking something because it will help me because I want to know something or my organization is lacking representation or can I genuinely be collaborating? Can I genuinely be helping BFA's purpose? And that might be different for different organizations, but I think we are starting to have a problem with people who feel exploitative and, and it, it, it took a while to take the curtains away and actually see that. Because if a, if a big organization approaches you, first very excited, right? And and you you won't necessarily be like, wait a minute, is this a bit, <laughs> is this a bit? Mm, let let's look look uh, you know look a bit more in detail. So I think that's that's the first question. Like when you come to us with a dialogue, let it be an open dialogue and not a set agenda that you have or a set project that you might think you need to do for your organization. So I think those open conversations are very very helpful. 
and you know don't get offended if we don't want to work with you either um as i've said we are voluntary we're hoping to change that in the future but you know it's that's just the way we work things take a long time and yeah that's and and that's how we want to work as well and that should be fine we are not on the industry's agenda we are not an architecture project with a deadline or client <laughs> Cass, do you want to ask your question? Um, yes, I think it kind of tail ends again on the last one. But um, I've had this issue and I was just wondering if there's any advice or tips and tricks um, to navigate through people's engagement to not to ensure you're not being used for their own agenda in terms of tokenism or a hot topic, because we all know you know, we're, we're currently front page news given the last years of events. So how do you decipher or navigate that field and ensure you're not used as a token or someone else's agenda? I think you've tapped on it a bit, but I'd love to yeah. dig in a bit more. Sure. Um, I think we had to um, fall through the holes a few times. <laughs> so be used a few times to realize that that was what's happening. Um, and I think over time, we were, we were able to build up a series of inquiries that narrowed this very down. So, uh, you know, I, I said that about when someone comes to us with a job opportunity, there's a series of questions we ask. Um, you know, it's who's working at your office, who's lead the, he leading this, um, are you giving new people a support system, will there be mentoring, you know, if, if there's a problem, how will it be dealt with, what's the salaries like, do you pay your men and women the same thing? Some people don't answer these questions, you know, and then that's that's a red flag. So I think building up a series of inquiries that will a, be a, make make you able to narrow down the possibility that you might be exploited is useful. I don't think it will ever work 100%, but over time we were able to add more questions to our questions to our questions because of experience. Yeah, I think there's something really interesting in the power of saying no. And I think it's it's a real journey. Um, uh, I myself has still not mastered it, so it's great to, to actually be talking about this because I don't think we talk about it enough. Yeah. Um, and it's only once you've said yes to something and you realized that it's maybe not been for the right reasons and it's kind of hard to extricate yourself from it. So I think it's it's really good advice. Um, I, uh, I think what's really amazing and maybe a testament to like the success of BFA is like also how much networking is happening in the chat. <laughs> that okay. People are getting in touch with each other, giving each other advice. And it's great that even your lecture has become a kind of space um, for your network to expand and grow and for this to happen. So it's really terrific. Um, does anyone have extra uh, or additional questions? Um, I mean, I can also keep going. Um, okay, there's a, a question saying um, how do you as an organization prevent the tokenizing of POCs in our profession, people of color in our profession? Mm -hmm. um, trying to be intentional about who we work with. So going a little bit back to the conversation that we've had, um, looking at the things that organi the organizations have done in the past, um, but also being better at questioning some things that we see that we don't like. Um, and that's not necessarily on Twitter. <laughs> but, you know, when, when you are in a meeting or when you are having a conversation and people say something that, that feel um, off <laughs> in many ways, uh, can be off in terms of racism or sexism, just to have the confidence to call it out. And then, yeah, there, there might be the angry black woman uh, or, or whatever that might say. <laughs> but as an organization, we're trying to do that because of what we're here for. Whereas maybe at my workplace, I'd be less confident to do that. You know, so having that backup of BFA as an organization to be able to question some of the things that maybe in, you know, alone you might not be able to do. And I think we want BFA to allow that for our membership. So, you know, if you have a problem at work or if you don't know how to address something or if you feel like someone is, um, you know, exploiting you in some way, we hope that BFA can help you with that because doing that alone is very hard. Or even just coming on Slack and asking if this has happened to anyone else, that's a really good conversation and it does happen sometimes. And that's, that's support because then you realize it's not you. Um, so, yeah, I think to answer your question is building up confidence of our members to be able to 
call things out, but also to take the support of the network to get them help with that. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, um, oh, I think in it, I think based on everything you said, uh, Cass has asked, how do how does someone join BFA? Yeah, so we have um, the so membership at blackfemark.com um, or on our website, how to join a member. Just email us your um, why you want to join and then you'll be able to get onboarded on our Slack and uh, our newsletters and, and be involved. It's digital right now. And hopefully soon we will have um, more events and things going on as well. And just in case you can't see the chat number, um, Halima, who asked the previous question, said that, yes, thank you, you have answered the question. Okay. <laughs> um, Lynn has a question. I'm just going to ask her to unmute. Yes, hi. I just wanted to follow on the ARB situation and trying to locate the first, I'm a historian, so I was yeah. very interested in your uh, efforts to find the uh, first black registered ar woman architect in Britain. And it may take, and, and as you said, it may take ARB a while, but I just have a couple of suggestions yeah. that might help get a better idea of the contribution of black women architects in Britain. And one of the things you could do would be to, and it might be useful to involve students in this project, is to have them look through the periodicals, say at the RIBA or indeed the Bartlett, to find out who the first black woman architect to be, whose work was illustrated was. That's an interesting question and proposition. Also, I think um, finding out whose work was the first shown in an exhibition. Mm. Questions related to uh, first important women making contributions in architecture. And of course, the first black woman member of the RIBA, that should be something that someone should be able to find out even if uh, the Architects Registration Board can't provide the kind of ultimate answer about the first registered woman architect. So those are just a few things that, that came to mind when you were talking about your research efforts. And I just wanted to throw that in from, from a, my perspective. Thank you, that's really helpful. Great, good luck. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lynn. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, Lynn actually um, spearheaded together with Elizabeth Darling the, the multi-year research project that the AA did um, uh, when it was a centenary of women studying at the AA. So they really tried to uncover lots of hidden histories that like really weren't talked about. And um, you know, the, the uncovered the stories of the four first uh, female students who studied at the AA. And so many others as well. So it's um, really great that you're here and and to give that advice. Um, yeah, just um, is, does anyone else have any questions? Um, I guess Neva, maybe you could tell us a bit of like what 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 might be next for for BFA in terms of what you're planning. Yeah, um, so we are trying to move away from the voluntary network thing um, from, for practical reasons. Um, we had a really amazing team um, in the past two years of volunteers from our network who were able to um, help us grow. Uh, that it's graphics, um, membership onboarding, projects, running events, um, or social media when it was fun. That was our team back then. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think we that was a really interesting and great journey, but we realized that it doesn't feel right to do that voluntarily. We can do that because we set it up. Um, but you know, having our members as much love and patience and drive they had to do that, they didn't want to go, believe me. Um, that that just didn't feel right. So I think the next step for us is to um yeah, become more sustainable financially. Um, to be able to um, do the things that we say we do, support support our membership the way that we want others to support them when they work with us. Um, so yeah, we got funding for the first time uh, from DBase and some business support from uh, MeWe, um, which is incredible. It's really useful. Um, we Obviously, none of us went to business school. <laughs> so having that support is um, integral just to step back a little bit and to look at BFA from a, a non-insular perspective. Um, so yeah, that, that is really uh, where we are right now. 
Um, and now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we connect again with our membership in person, but also virtually um, and uh, do more engagement. Amazing. I mean, I guess maybe that's like a nice moment to, to wrap up because it's like looking to the future. Yeah. Um, but I just, it's been such an inspiring talk, but also a conversation to follow. I think there's been so many interesting questions and so much conversation in general about what we together can do to make, um, not just architecture better, but society as a whole. So thank you so much. It's a really great start to the series. And I hope lots of you in the audience will come back, um, for more, uh, next week we have at the same time, we have cave bureau talking about their Anthropocene Museum. And then the following week, we have After Party talking about a new model for criticism. So, um, and then there's more to come in the rest of the term. So please come back. And Neba, thank you so much for such a terrific lecture. And um, also to everyone in the chat for all your conversations and to Shumi and Cass for all the advice that you were also giving there. It's been a, um, a really wonderful evening. Thank you so much, everyone been really great and it's lovely to see faces honestly that doesn't happen often I appreciate it a lot <laughs> yeah it's really incredible um just before everyone goes I might try and do a mass unmute so you can actually get a round of applause for all of the amazing achievements of BFA and everything you're doing one sec okay yeah. asked everyone to unmute <laughs> Thank you. People are already sending Thank in their requests you. for membership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.